Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to today's virtual breakfast meeting from Michigan State University Extension. My name is Jim Islib. I'm a field crops educator serving the counties in the Upper Peninsula. And uh, we'd like to ask everyone to make sure that your microphone is muted. And uh, if you're interested in the um, Michigan um, pesticide applicator recertification credits or the CCA credits, we need to have your full name on the sign in, uh, your first and last name. If you signed in with something other than that, you can go into the participant list and click on more and you can rename yourself. But we do need your full name to verify that you are with us so that you can receive those credits later if you want them. During the meeting today, you'll have access to a chat box. And if you would please type any questions that you have as our speakers move through their talks, uh, put your questions in the chat box. And at the end of their talks, we'll make sure that those questions are covered. Uh, we are offering restricted use pesticide credits. That's the Michigan Certified Pesticide Applicator Research Credits and also CCA credits. And the information to access those credits will be provided at about 7.30. Um, we have another important feature uh, for today's program, and that is uh, an effort on our part to collect information about people who participate in these virtual breakfast programs. This is voluntary. Uh, it's not voluntary for us to ask for it. It's voluntary for you to give it. Uh, your name uh, will be kept uh, on record as having attended. However, there won't be any personal uh, way to identify you, but rather you'll be identified as a member of the group that participated in this program. There's a link in the chat. If you click on that link, you can fill out a simple form telling us a little bit about yourself. Uh, and we would appreciate it very much if you would do that. Our, our speaker today is Dr. Aaron Burns. Dr. Burns is an assistant professor with MSU. She's a weed scientist and serves as a weed science specialist for MSU Extension. And the topic today is post-emergent weed control. I'm going to stop uh, sharing my screen and invite Aaron to share hers. Thanks, Jim, for that introduction, and thank you for uh, joining us this morning. Um, today, we're going to be talking about post-emergence weed control, but it's good to frame um, or talk about weed control in general in our program goals. And you have two different kind of bins of these program goals. The first are our short-range goals, and that's to manage this year's weeds to protect crop yield. And then often more importantly are our long-range goals which is to deplete the soil seed bank from weed seeds. And those are the, the weed seeds that go into the seed bank in the fall, and that's what you're then battling the, you know, in the next season. So if we can really drive down the weed seed bank, we have a, a much more long-term sustainable weed control plan on our, on our fields. And just an important note, if you did have a difficult weed control season last year or, or large breaks on some of your fields, um, weed control this year is going to be fairly important, both to preserve that, that short-term yield and then also to have that long-term impact on, on the seed bank to drive down uh, those seeds that are ultimately going to be what you're trying to control in the, in the next few seasons. An effective herbicide program that's comprehensive has um, starting clean, so you want to plant into clean fields. This can either be achieved through burn down or tillage operations. Then following those up by applying full rates of pre-residual herbicides. And these first two bullet points are, were covered earlier this season as part of the virtual breakfast. And then today I'm going to be talking about effective post-emergence options uh, with residuals. And first we're going to go over a number of different parameters that will help you decide when to actually make that, that post-emergence herbicide application. And the first is when do I actually apply these post-emergence herbicides? And the first thing to think about is weed height. And you can find information of weed height and the relation to how effective that herbicide will be in a, in a few ways. And weed height really plays a role in how susceptible it actually is to the herbicide. I'm sure you've gone out and sprayed weeds that were a little too tall and, 
and you've gone back and, and they haven't been controlled. And that's because uh, smaller weeds are just easier to control in your field. So the first way we can look at this is the height on the label. So on the screen, I have just a snapshot of a commonly used herbicide here in Michigan. And then it gives a different rates in fluids per acre or fluid ounces per acre. And then how tall that weed could actually be that could be controlled. And I'm just gonna highlight a few of the common weeds that we battle here in Michigan um, to just show you what some of these heights might be. So for horseweed or mare's tail, we applied 32 fluid ounces of this product. We can control 18 inch mare's tail, 20 inch common lambs quarters, uh, to 24 inch palmer amaranth or other pigweed species. And you might be thinking to yourself, wow, that sounds like a really tall, tall weed to be controlling. And that's because the label just considers how susceptible that, that weed might be but it doesn't consider how competitive um, those weeds are at that height. So on the screen, I have a picture of 12 inch uh, Palmer Amaranth competing with corn. You can think that that's gonna have a much larger impact on corn yield than if you just had four inch Palmer Amaranth competing with corn. So this idea of um, how long those weeds are actually competing with our crop is quite important to preserve end of season yield. And, and often the longer they're competing, the, the larger reductions that we do see in overall crop yield. <clears throat> and just to <clears throat> demonstrate a study that was conducted across the Midwest in a large number of states. And what they did is they went in and applied a glyphosate or Roundup when weeds were two inches tall, four inches tall, six inches tall, nine inches tall, or 12 inches tall. And then they kept that field weed free for the rest of the season. So this is the impact of just that early season weed competition on corn yield. So if we were able to control weeds when they were two inches tall, we really observed um, very minimal yield loss. If we waited till they were four inches tall, overall 3% yield loss, six inches tall, 7% yield loss, nine inches tall, that goes to 10%, 12 inches, now we have a 21% yield loss. And then I just extrapolated this out. We waited till 14 inches, it's about 30.5% yield loss and 16 inch weeds were at 39% yield loss. So the longer those weeds are competing with our crop, um, the, the greater yield loss that we see. So applying these herbicides when the weeds are, are smaller is both um, easier to control those, those weedy species and also you'll preserve yield overall um, much better. Another thing to consider are weed growth rates. So many weeds grow very slowly initially and then they have um, rapid growth after that. And this can be hard. You could go out and scout one day and have pretty small weeds, wait a few days to apply our post-emergence herbicide application and have pretty tall weeds. An example of this could be horseweed or mare's tail. So on the left-hand side of your screen, I have a picture of a horseweed rosette, that, that circular uh, plant that grows very low to the ground and then um, a, a plant on your right, which we consider a bolted plant, where you can see now that stem is uh, rapidly elongated. It's very tall and it grows pretty quickly. And this conversion can happen uh, quite fast in your field. So knowing what stage your weeds are at, and then if you have one of these weeds that can grow quite quickly, that will help you decide when to make these post applications. Another example is water hemp. Water hemp has been measured to grow one to 1.25 inches per day. If the, uh, the conditions are right and Palmer amaranth can grow as much as two and a half inches per day. So when we're trying to control, you know, two to three inch weeds, um, we want to keep in mind these weed growth rates also. Another way that dictates our post-emergence applications are crop growth stage and or height. And this is because crop tolerance to the herbicide is influenced by that growth stage or the height of the crop. And on the screen right now, I'm showing a snapshot of our weed control guide. At the end of the uh, presentation, I'll give you some resources on how to get your own or some fact sheets that we have highlighting some of these on our website, in which we do have the minimum and both the maximum height. This is for post-emergence applications in corn, but there are other tables for the various other crops that we cover in the guide. Um, in which it's usually in inches or sometimes the number of collars, depending on what herbicide we're talking about. But this would be another good resource to look at if you're thinking you might uh, be getting to some of those maximum restrictions 
on the on the herbicide it's on the label but we've also included it in the weed control guide and then another uh, parameter to be thinking about is herbicides and your crop rotation restrictions so many herbicides may have um, significant residual activity and this is mostly important in years where you might have planted a little bit later so then you're applying your post-emergence herbicides later in the season than you might uh, be used to and then you'd want to check uh, the herbicide label or once again, we have a table at the end of the weed control guide that goes over crop rotation restrictions. And these are in, in months after you've applied them. So we have all the herbicides and then various crops that we grow throughout the state. So you'd wanna make sure that you're applying your post-emergence herbicide still within that window um, that you can then plant the crop that you're, that you're choosing to the following year. And then just a, a short note on, on soybean herbicides and when we apply those post-emergence as uh, many of the, the new dicamba labels have, have new restrictions on those. And I'm just gonna highlight a few. Um, we did make a video that is on our website that goes over all of the new changes to these labels. Uh, Dr. Christy Sprague outlines those, those quite well and there are quite a few. So I'm just gonna um, put in the cutoffs today but you'd also want to visit that um, those labels and then, and then that video is a great guide that highlights some of those. So Tavium, you can apply through V4 soybean or June 30th, whichever comes first. Extendamax, do not apply after June 30th. And if you um, are at R1 before that, applications are prohibited after R1. And then Ingenia also has that June 30th cutoff. So these are pretty important cutoffs. Uh, to keep in mind if you are applying some of these dicamba registered products in soybean. And then 2,4-D choline, which is in Enlist 1 or a component in Enlist Duo, can be applied no later than R2 soybean. So this is just a, a snapshot of what those, those cutoffs are. And then um, check out the video that is on our, on our website, which I'll put in the chat later. Um, or if you want, you can just Google msuweeds.com and that will uh, get you to our website and you can uh, watch that video too as a good refresher on what some of these uh, restrictions are. But overall, when we're talking about crop stage, that often fails to consider weed emergence timing and the level of infestation. And what I mean by this is that weeds that emerge before the crop can have a large impact and significantly reduce yield by the time that uh, crop reaches that growth stage. So if you did have um, issues, maybe you didn't start as clean as you wanted to, and you're waiting to apply that herbicide till a certain growth stage, um, you'd wanna keep in mind that those weeds are growing and having that competitive impact with the crop. And the same goes if we apply our post-emergence herbicides too early. So the weeds that emerge after the crop, and this can result in herbicide application prior to the majority of weeds emerging. And this is a, uh, particularly important if you apply a herbicide that has no residual activity that, that won't control those weeds um, for a few weeks out. So knowing when the majority of your weeds will emerge and, and scouting those fields is, is quite helpful when we're applying our post-emergence herbicides. And then I'd just like to point out two um, different environmental impacts that can have roles in post-emergence herbicide efficacy. The first is after heavy rains. So this leads to both reduced competitive ability of the injured crop, those weeds or that crop cannot metabolize that herbicide as well. So they're growing slower and weed competition might be more pronounced. And we also want to therefore avoid applying herbicides to stress crops. So we don't see an increase in crop injury. And that is because herbicide selectivity is based off the crop's ability to metabolize that herbicide into non-toxic forms. Um, so when crops just aren't growing as well, they're not metabolizing as quickly, and we see those pronounced um, injury symptomologies. The second, and what you might be more thinking about now based off our current um, conditions, is impact of dry conditions on weed control. So these have two roles, both on post-emergence herbicide efficacy. So these post-herbicides are less effective on weeds when they're drought stressed. And that's because in order to kill the weed, that herbicide needs to make it into that, into that weed. So drought overall reduces absorption, translocation, and ultimately metabolism of those herbicides. And when those aren't going at a quick rate, um, our weed control is reduced. And then a more important note 
are impacts on residual herbicides. So precipitation plays a large role in residual herbicide efficacy. First, it moves that herbicide off the soil surface into the soil profile, um, which will reduce loss off the soil surface. It then makes sure that that herbicide can actually get into that upper two inches of soil, which is where the majority of our weed seeds are germinating and emerging from, so it can control those weeds. And then we want to make sure we actually have enough moisture for those herbicides to be absorbed by those, those weed seedlings. Um, so if, if we don't get timely precipitation or if you don't you know, irrigate, if you have the ability after this residual herbicide application, our weed control might be reduced and it'd be especially important to you know, scout a few weeks after if we have not had um, some of those timely rain events. And on corn, I'd just like to highlight uh, one fact sheet that highlights um, Palmer amaranth and water hemp control in corn. This was based off of um, some great research that Dr. Christy Sprague and her crew did a few years ago. And th these are some troublesome weeds that can have large impacts on, on corn production. And what they have in this, in this uh, fact sheet are the different trade names and then the group numbers, which helps us diversify our, our herbicide resistant management. And then when we apply these pre or post emergence, and these are up on our website, and this would be a good guide to help you out if you do have these two troublesome weeds on your field that you can um, visit and, and make a good plan. And then finally on the corn side, this past year, I looked at the past five years of our commercial comparisons trials in which we've conducted on campus and just looked at the economic returns of some of those programs. And these are box plots, so the black line is the median economic return. So that's the middle economic return you could expect from one of these programs. And our pre-only programs, this was $540. Early post programs, $650. And two past programs are $720. So half of the returns would be higher than that number, half would be lower. So if you've noticed, this median for the two past is $180 more than the pre and $70 more than the early post. And our early post programs are $110 more than the pre. So really putting on these post-emergence herbicides um, will help with that overall economic return for your, for your production. And then for post-emergence options in soybean, this will largely be dictated by what traded soybeans that you planted. So on the screen now, I just have a snapshot of the different uh, traits that you may have planted on your field. And this will really dictate um, what you can apply post-emergence uh, for some of our troublesome weed species. And once again, we have fact sheets both about uh, horseweed and mare's tail control or palmer amaranth and water hemp control in soybean. And those are good resources to look at for uh, further specifics. And then if you want to order the weed control guide, we still have some of those available. Um, you can go to shop.msu.edu and you can find our weed control guide on there or just Google the MSU weed control guide and this link will come up. And then on a final note, um, we're pretty excited. We'd like to have you save the date. We're planning on having um, our, after one year of not having our weed tour, having it again this June 30th. We're working on specific details, but before we have those details, we just wanted people to, to jot down the date if they were interested in that. And with that, I believe I'm, I'm out of time. We could probably take some questions after Jeff goes over his, uh, his update. Uh, once again, let me encourage you to put your questions into uh, into the chat box. We have a couple have come in. Uh, uh, George Bird indicates that he, he has a comment on soil moisture risk to cold injury. Uh, have a comment to make, uh, Dr. Bird. Turn on your mic and up yeah. Your uh, la last Friday morning, I visited a farm that had just lost uh, an early crop due to coal damage. And the farmer was very aware, okay, that this was uh, related to lack of soil moisture. He said that uh, with good soil moisture, he would not have lost that, that crop. But the thing that I found most interesting, and it was a sandy uh, uh, field, uh, that he said out there uh, in his farm, currently it is a desert. Well, thanks for that comment, Dr. Bird. Dr. George Bird is a professor emeritus from Michigan State, a nematologist. And uh, I'd like to ask Mike Staten, since he's on, uh, if you could give us your thoughts about freeze injury to soybeans. Jim, thanks a lot. Uh, 
Bruce McKellar called me yesterday morning and uh, mentioned that down in the Decatur area, Hartford, Lawrence, Decatur area, Southwest Michigan, they had some really low temperatures uh, for multiple days. And, uh, and they also, like Jeff had said, we made a lot of planting progress. So we had beans that were up and out of the ground and exposed to this. And they also had the dry soil conditions. So everything, just a perfect storm, it helps a little bit, or maybe it hurts. Uh, but um, so I've got some pictures of that and, and I visited probably, I would say five, six fields yesterday, uh, different elevations, different areas and different stages of emergence. One of those five fields definitely needed to be replanted. And the good news was the pr producer realized that and did make the replanting decision. When I say replant, he basically didn't do anything to control or tear up the old plant. He, he just went in right next to the row and planted uh, with a lower population. He would happen to be in 30 inch rows, so lots of space to be able to do that. Um, the other fields, uh, one showed just some damage to the cotyledons, but nothing to the true leaves. So it's kind of surprising to me because the true leaves should have been more susceptible. Um, but I'll show you some pictures, Jim, if I could uh, uh, share my screen. Can you see my screen? No. Well, I'm not so handy at doing this. Let's see. Maybe I don't really need to show you some pictures, but... Um, Basically, the rule of thumb is you want to wait about five days for those plants to regrow. If the cotyledons are healthy looking or somewhat damaged, but yet where they attach to the stem is still fleshy and not, not sunken or water uh, leaking, um, there's, there's hope for those plants. So that's kind of a really simple way to assess it is just look at the cotyledons and uh, see if they have somewhat uh, healthy uh, appearance to them, especially where they attach to the hypocotyl. If they do, that's the critical area. That's where the meristematic tissue is and that would produce the new growth. So, um, and with the temperatures that Jeff's talking about, you should see new growth, I would say in probably three to five days uh, with these warmer temperatures coming up. So just look for new growth at the base of the cotyledons. And there is an article available on MSUE News on this, assessing uh, frost freeze damage to soybeans. It was posted, I think, on April 15th. So you should be able to see an article there. Are there any questions on, on frost freeze damage? If they come in, Mike will catch them in the chat. Okay, thanks, Jim. Thank you. Uh, a few more questions to, uh, to respond to. Uh, there are multiple reports of the supply of supply chain disruptions for herbicides. Are there alternatives for post-emergent pesticides to consider if they do not have the pesticide of choice available? Yeah, that's that's a great question, and and um, yeah, we have heard some reports of some herbicides being harder to get to than others. And I see Christy's on too, so she can talk on the soybean side. But on the corn side, there's there's a large number of effective post-emergence options that are outside of, of some of the herbicides that are hard to get to. So there's a, a large number of our HPPD inhibitors, group 27, such as, you know, Callisto, Lotus, Impact. Those are in a many, many different premixes paired with residual components. Um, so those are good. And then just in general, if you're still, you know, planting and have the opportunity to still apply pre's with residuals, that will that will control those populations and buy you a lot more time before you have to apply a post-emergence herbicide. So having those that first pass down to, to really help with early season weed control is, is going to be pretty important if you are running into some of those, those issues. And Christy, you have something to add? Sure. Um, I would just echo a lot of what Aaron said. So, I mean, definitely the glyphosate supply chain, as well as um, any of the glufosinate products, so the liberties, are the ones that are really kind of um, hurting. So, um, as Aaron said, making sure, you know, while there's a lot of soybean planting still going on, there's the opportunity to put um, soil applied herbicides down. The other thing is thinking about, you know, um, some of those products might be rationed a little bit. So think about where the best bang for your buck is on uh, applying those herbicides. So if you think it's in, in your uh, soybean crop versus your corn crop, um, also those, you know, one way to kind of get rid of some of those later season applications, if you put some of those residuals in there. So 
in soybeans, definitely we have a lot of things like warrant dual Zidua outlook that can be applied with a glyphosate or a Liberty type product to get you some residual control later in the season, particularly if you've got like water hemp or palmer. Um, and then we still have a lot of the uh, non-GMO products. So just, you know, think about what weeds you're trying to control. You know, we still have a lot of Flexstar, Cobra, uh, Select Max. So if we're trying to control either grasses or some of the ragweeds or just some of the pigweeds that we don't have resistance to. So just kind of keep those things in mind. Thanks, Christy. Uh, Aaron, here's a question from Leon Cook. With the dry weather, uh, do we need to be incorporating pre-emergent herbicides? And that's another good question. So, I mean, usually you'd only want to incorporate pre-emergence herbicides if they are, you know, formulated as a pre-plant incorporated product. And normally that's because that herbicide is formulated that either um, will volatilize off the soil surface quite quickly or has implications with, with sunlight. So many of our, our newer formulations, those have been changed and that's why you don't have to incorporate them any longer. So I think I would I'd probably only recommend incorporating them if you used one of those, those herbicides because if we do get that, that rain event, um, you then have the potential to move that farther down through the soil profile um, both to potentially injure injure the corn or uh, or move it out of the the weed control area, but Christy might have some good ideas too. Yeah, I think um, especially with some of the dry weather, some of the incorporation wouldn't be so bad, and it really depends on the product. Um, so, for example, in soybeans, um, you know, Valor is one that we usually don't recommend incorporation because we see streaking for weed control, but. There are a lot of products, if you look in the weed guide, um, there will we'll list, can be applied pre-plant incorporated. So in that case, you know, if we start thinking about some of the implications that Jeff's talked about with dry weather, that would help get that herbicide into that, incorporated into that seed germination zone. So, you know, that's not such a bad thing. Usually we try to make sure that ideally we want to get rain within, you know, the first seven to 10 days after those applications. Um, but we do believe those pre's are still gonna help reduce some of the weed populations, even though they may not be as effective without getting them incorporated. So just you know, be aware of what products you're using. And there are certain ones that we can incorporate that would get it into that um, seed germination zone. And that next question is, is related from Jeremy. How, how long can herbicides lay on the soil surface without a rain before you lose effectiveness? I know that like with our stuff, generally, if we can get a decent, we usually try to say at least a half inch or so, half to three quarters of an inch. We'd like to see it within, um, you know, usually seven to 10 days. Um, and <laughs> the forecast doesn't look that good. Hopefully, hopefully we can get some moisture in there at some point. Um, but the other thing to think about too is with the cooler temperatures, some of those weeds may be not you know, germinating, they're sitting in dry soil. So, you know, maybe we have a little bit of longer time. So, you know, where we're, where we have some issues is if we're getting a lot of weeds that are coming up without that herbicide being in that zone. And just to follow up to that, uh, Christy, the odds of, of a half to three quarters of an inch for, especially for the Southern lower are unfortunately pretty low. Okay. Uh, say at least for a week, maybe even longer than that. So it's, 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 it's going to be, it's going to be tricky. Yeah. So in, in that case, um, I don't know what Aaron's thoughts are, but if you can be timely with your early post applications, if you do have a broad spectrum herbicide like glyphosate or Liberty, particularly in corn, where we have those one pass early post applications and you can be timely, um, putting those residuals in with that application, knowing that, hey, we're probably not gonna get good incorporation anytime soon. You may wanna hit those weeds when they're about two inches tall, if you've got a glyphosate or glufosinate and include some of those residuals. So I think from some of Erin's slides, she showed that a lot of those early post applications do a really good job and can be pretty cost effective. It's just making sure that you're timely so you're not losing any yield on your corn. Yeah, agree. <clears throat> A little tougher in soybeans just because we don't have a lot of great products that fit into that aspect. <clears throat> well, that was a pretty tricky question to answer. So thanks for 
for that. Uh, next question from Wade. Uh, would you continue to apply a product like Metribuzin uh, uh, since we have a small chance of rain? Personally, I'd like to have Metribuzin out there from the standpoint of we just don't have a lot of good pre's for uh, horse weed control. So even if we get a little bit of activity, we're reducing that population a little bit. Okay, and, and a comment from uh, Chris Defonso. Chris, maybe you'd like to take the mic and, and expand on that a little. Yeah, I just wanted to um, talk about some of the moth reports. We don't have much in our traps here in Michigan. I haven't gotten any true army worm. I don't think, uh, maybe Eric's got a few down in the, the, the southern trapping area, but there was kind of a slug of them in Laporte, Indiana, so that's just south of Berrien. But when you move across Indiana, they, they didn't have very much. So just that one slug of them there, you know, maybe they got one little front that came in right over that area. There is a little bit more black cutworm activity, a lot of intensive activity in Indiana. My traps aren't intensive yet. That's where you get like nine over the course of two, two nights. And uh, Eric's doesn't look intensive yet e e either. So it's just kind of dribs and drabs. And again, without some of those storm fronts, then maybe we're not getting them up here. Uh, I was in a field yesterday digging grubs in the Decatur area. And uh, one of the fields was, was pretty grim. It's just real, it's like dry all the way down. I mean, th these are very sandy uh, fields, but when you got down there, the soil temperature, I think Jeff showed that it was actually kind of cool down in that. So I, I think it was about a week too early to see these grubs coming back up to the surface. They will move up and down depending on the temperature. And I, the one thing I'm thinking about is if these seeds are just sitting there and they're not, you know, they're not, they don't have a lot of water and you've got, you know, a little bit of something to eat, those grubs will wipe that out lickety split if those plants aren't growing fast, you know, because they, they just don't have a, they don't have enough water. So I, I could see how a smaller number of grubs could actually do a bit of damage in these real slow growing seeds just sitting there and not, nothing really happening. So Anyway, if, if you do see that kind of grub damage in that southwest uh, kind of sandy area, you know, call uh, one, of the, one of the agents down there because then I can come down and kind of look at it. That's all. Thank you, Chris. Um, Eric uh, Anderson comments that he's only caught one true army worm uh, this week. Let's see. There's another question that I... It was for Mike Staten uh, from Gale. Do we need nitrogen on soybeans if nitrogen has been removed by pastured wheat cover crop, a pastured wheat cover crop? Oh, typically not. We don't see an economical response to nitrogen applications to soybeans. You see an early season growth benefit and you will see sometimes a yield benefit, but does the yield translate into economic return is very, very rare. I guess, Jim, I want to understand this is a, a grass pasture that's been turned under or killed with a herbicide. What, what's happened to this grass pasture again? It was a, a wheat cover crop that was packed. Oh, wheat cover crop. Okay. Um, no, I, I really don't think so. You're, um, no, it, it doesn't doesn't pay year in and year out. Just make sure it's well inoculated, nodulated, uh, you know, inoculated seed, and you should be good. Okay, Mike, thanks. Um, I think we're caught up on the on the chat. Jim, could I take one more stab at showing those frost freeze pictures? Sure. All right, I think I might have be able to do it this time. Hot dog. Good. Okay. So this is what we don't want to see. These plants look really tough. Um, cotyledons are burned back. The, not only are the unifoliates burned back, I'm not worried about the unifoliates being burned back typically. It's when the cotyledons look really rough like these. They say that this stage over here is the most vulnerable stage, the crook stage, as we're coming out of the soil. And the reason for that is it's the highest point on the plant, so it's most likely to be exposed. And it's also the most vulnerable point because it's below all of the, the meristematic tissue. So let me show you what that would look like. 
So this plant is absolutely toast. He's just not going to make it. We know that because look at how crispy fried those cotyledons are. But then look at this sunken area below. The meristematic tissue is right here. And we've got death below that point. That plant is just absolutely done. So what about these? Here's the unifoliates burned off really clearly. And probably the main growing point is probably dead. But look at how bright and healthy the, the cotyledons are. That gives me encouragement because where they attach to the hypocotyl is probably still viable. We don't know that for sure. This is the wait and see for, um, scenario. That other scenario, if these are brown and water sunken and dead, it's probably a dead plant. But this is just another close-up of that. Cotyledons are bright. Hypocotyl is still firm. That's another good test is, is, the, uh, the, is where the area where the cotyledons join the hypocotyl firm, or is it mushy? This area right here is just a critical, critical area. This part up here can be dead, dead as a doornail, as long as this area is viable. That's, that's the key. I'll show you why. Right here, the main growing point was dead on this plant or severely injured. And look at what's happening out of these, this, uh, this node, these two axillary buds are putting up two new shoots. That's what you look for when you're assessing those marginal plants about within five days. You're looking for signs of new growth, either from the main growing point, which can still happen, or either side of that out of this, this cotyledonary node. So that's how you know if and that's gonna be a completely viable plant. All right, thanks, Jim. Thank you, Mike, for the, the uh, very helpful and informative tips and the great pictures. I'm glad you're able to get them up. I guess the good news is uh, uh, that we're gonna get some warmer weather and the crummy news is that we're not gonna get any rain for a while, but uh, what are you gonna do? Jim, I have one other comment on that. Um, I submitted an article yesterday to MSUE News and it's posted and it will be sent out in the digest but it is uh, on soybean planting depth considerations for dry soils. When you're planting into dry soils, what do you do? Do you go deep? Do you go shallow? Do you stay the same? You know, what, what are your options? And those are all explained in that article. So encourage people to go to that if you have those kind of questions. Very good. Well, uh, I think we are, uh, we are caught up. There was one question about the email for uh, receiving the pesticide credits, and that email is house, T-H-O-U-S-E-T, -E at msu.edu. And Phil, unless you have any other uh, comments to add or things to pass along, I guess we're about ready to wrap it up. I think we're good, Jim. Okay, thanks everybody for joining us, and uh, uh, please join us again next week and we'll hear from Dr. Marty Chilvers about HeadScan.